Great. So winter can be a beautiful time for bird watching, especially for many of you that are kind of more on the beginning side of, of bird watching, maybe, or being familiar with our birds. What's lovely about Colorado is that in the winter time, we have all these birds that are year round residents and there's not nearly as many of them as when our bird population in Colorado um, gets much, much higher and much more diverse starting about the next like month and a half, six weeks to, um, to eight weeks. We'll start to see a lot of birds migrating back into the state. Um, and so it's a good time if you want to start really learning some of our birds that you would see year round regardless of the season so that when spring migration starts to come in and we get some of these other other birds in the mix, um, you feel like you've got a few birds that you're already confident in. Um, and the other thing that's really fascinating is when you think about bird migration, a lot of people think about migration only happening in the spring, but we actually have some migration happening right now. We have birds that come down to Colorado in winter, and so their migratory behavior um, actually spans the time frame of our winter here in Colorado. So we're going to talk a little bit um, about all of those kind of different species. So our open spaces and our yards both provide winter habitat. So this is our Audubon Nature Center at Chatfield State Park. Um, this is one of our demonstration gardens that we have right in front of the building. And so especially when we're talking about resources that winter birds need, they rely so much on our open spaces and then also our backyard habitat that we provide to help them get through the winter. So we want to think a little bit about who are some of these birds and what are the things that they need. So then that way we can really provide some of those um, key elements that they would need in order to be able to survive the winter. So when we think about birds that consume seeds, there's a lot of different bird beaks out there. So I'm going to focus tonight on a lot of our granivores. So these are birds that have that thick triangular shaped beak that are going to be consuming seeds most of the year. Um, but then the other interesting thing that happens is a lot of the birds that we're going to meet tonight switch to an insect diet the other three fourths of the year, spring, summer, and early fall. Um, so there's a lot of people, I think, that assume that birds that eat seeds are eating seeds all the time. Um, and the truth is there's actually a very small fraction of our bird species in Colorado that are truly feeding on seed always exclusively. Um, we also have our specialist seed eaters there. Um, so we have our granivores, and then you'll see that specialist seed eater. Uh, these are birds like our crossbill. So we have a couple of birds that really specialize in eating certain types of seeds in Colorado, um, but we're going to focus mostly on our, on our backyard birds tonight. So we're looking at birds that kind of have this ideal beak shape for opening seeds and grains. And then a lot of times um, birds that are dining on seeds in the winter are doing that because this is when provisions are at their most scarce and seeds are high in fat and high in protein. And so that allows for these birds to be able to sustain these heavy um, kind of cold winter months when there's just no other food around. There's not insects available most of the time. On occasion, you might get some insects even in the winter, um, but they're mostly eating on seeds and then also on berries too. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So a lot of the native plants that we have were the natural kind of resources for seed. Um, so we've sort of morphed as humans into providing artificial seed for birds, which certainly can have its place. Um, but one of the things that we at Denver Audubon really strive to share with people is that the more we can create habitat allows for these kind of connected pieces of habitat because birds look at a landscape as far as like what are the resources available. And so if a neighborhood or someone's home has a bunch of these different elements all combined in one place, birds are going to frequent that area more regularly, more frequently. So conifer trees are one of those things that we have an abundance of in Colorado, but it gives on, you know, it kind of depends on your elevation. Um, but if you have space, if you have land, one of the biggest things that you can do is plant a conifer tree, something like a ponderosa pine or a Colorado blue spruce that are native pine species to Colorado, which means they're already well adapted for being here. Um, and also they sometimes require, you know, obviously a lot of water to get a step 
established, but as they start to mature, you can cut back on that water quite a, quite a deal. So in some cases, certain species of conifer trees can also be considered xeric or low water. Um, so these are great options for a lot of birds because not only will they feed on all of the pine nuts that are inside of these pine cones throughout the winter, but they also will use them for nesting in the spring and uh, the fall. So they're really important nesting habitat as well. Other native plant sources for seeds include things like our grama grasses. So on the left side of the screen, we've got something called side oats grama. Um, and so side oats grama, because all the seed has kind of flag, uh, on the right side of the plant there, that's the side oats grama. And then on the right, that's our state grass of Colorado, the blue grama. And so these are landscaping grasses that you can put in in your property, either in your gardening beds, um, or if you have larger property than that, um, seeding an area that's got these native grass seeds in it is really going to be wonderful to have seed sources available to birds throughout the winter. The other really amazing thing about a lot of our grasses that are native to the state of Colorado is they also are host plants for a lot of our butterflies and our moths. And so these are insects that can't lay their eggs on anything else other than something like a grama grass. And then those caterpillars, when they hatch out, also help to feed baby birds that might be nesting on your property. So a lot of really good benefits. Um, one of the other native plants um, is Mexican hat or prairie coneflower. There's a couple of different common names that it goes by, um, and it comes in a couple of different color varieties. So it comes in that kind of beautiful red, orange, maroon, and then also on the left, a yellow. And so these are also really wonderful um, seed producing plants that are in the sunflower family. And so they are able to provide some of that overwintering seed for something like an American goldfinch who might come in and look at something like this and be able to kind of cling to the stem of the of the plant and then use their beaks to kind of pluck some of those seeds out. And then the other thing I love about the photo on the left, obviously these are taken in the summer when everything's blooming, but you can see that there's a little native um, grasshopper that's right on the top, and then there's a native bee that's flying through the back. Um, and so they're also really beneficial for some of our native insects in the spring, summer, and, and early fall. So those are just a couple of examples of some of the native plants that you could plant. There's many, many more choices. That's a whole different presentation. <laughs> native plants for birds. It's, I, it's a, another class I do anywhere from an hour to three hours, given the content and what we're covering. Um, but you can also supplement with bird feeders. You can supplement these natural food sources with a variety of different bird feeder options. So I've got all of them listed here, anything from a, pl a platform feeder to like a finch sock. Some people go so far as to pro provide dried mealworms to certain types of birds. Um, there's suet feeders, oriole feeders, um, tube feeders with a squirrel cage. We will chat about squirrels a little bit later because this is wildlife of winter. So I am going to cover a lot of bird stuff, but there's a couple other species that we'll chat about too later on. Um, and then you've got your kind of tube feeder, your traditional tube feeder, which is what a lot of people are most familiar with. And then nectar feeders, of course, seasonally for um, hummingbirds. There are not problems in and of themselves with bird feeders, um, but I'm sure one of the questions that might get asked tonight is in regards to avian influenza, of which we're having a huge outbreak of here in Colorado. Um, but that's also where understanding like wild bird diets and also how diseases move um, is really important because sometimes, there are diseases that can impact bird feeders, but avian flu doesn't tend to be one of them. Um, so I can uh, definitely delve into that a little bit later, um, but there's a lot of different variety out there for being able to provide uh, bird feeders. If you want to do something in the winter time, I, we usually recommend like a suet feeder and then like a tube feeder or platform feeders. Those are all really good choices. Orioles are a migratory species, so you wouldn't necessarily have an Oriole feeder out in the winter time. Um, but if you wanna start with something, a tube feeder is a great choice um, or a suet feeder because suet also has a lot of fat that obviously the seed is wrapped in. And so a lot of birds really love to have suet. Now, the other thing I 
love to share is that not all seed is created equal. So we get a lot of questions from people about what type of bird seed should I purchase? And that sort of depends on who you want to attract. And I will say that as someone who's worked for some really large like pet stores in my career, also veterinary hospitals um, and zoos and aquariums, and now a nature center, I have fed a lot of animals, a lot of things. <laughs> And so not all birdseed is created equal. If you buy bags of birdseed that are really inexpensive from large box stores, a lot of times if you actually look at the contents that are in those birdseed packets, packages, they're not going to be the highest quality seed. Um, unfortunately, they put a lot of filler seed in it. So this is seed that birds aren't even going to eat. So certain types of seed mixes will sometimes cause weeds to grow underneath people's bird feeders, and they're not always sure as to why that is. And that's because a lot of birds will kick out seed that they don't want to eat, and then it creates a huge mess on the ground. It attracts rodents. It attracts um, mice, rats, squirrels. So it's important to understand that not all seed is created equal. So this was a really wonderful study. There was actually a study that Washington Post did where they bought a few different bags of bird seed and tried to figure out what was in it. So there are mixes out there that you can buy called no Milo, no mess, because Milo tends to be a filler seed. Um, as opposed to something like black oil sunflower, which it turns out more birds prefer black oil sunflower to anything else that's out there. Um, and then you've got things like cracked sunflower and white striped sunflower. These are just obviously different varieties of sunflower seed. But if you look at this harvest songbird blend versus the next um, blend, which is our wild family, Almost half of that mix is Milo, and then a third of it is white millet, and only a teeny tiny bit of it is black oil sunflower, and they also threw in some cracked corn. Corn is another one of those fillers. It's used in dog food. It's used in a variety of different things. Even with people, it passes right through us. So um, there are differences in the types of seed used in, in bird seeds. So you would want to get familiar with what are some of these different seeds that are out there and then really start to gauge, mm, if I look at these ingredients list and I see that most of it is filler, like Milo and millet, then maybe it's not the best bang for your buck. The best bang for your buck, if you want to try something just to start, black oil sunflower. Like I shared before, so many birds love black oil sunflower and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and their feeder watch program did a whole study on this as well, where they watched what birds would come into a bird feeder and what seeds they would grab. And black oil sunflower was enjoyed by more species of bird than anything else. And black oil sunflower is actually relatively cheap if you're going to buy it commercially. The other thing that's great, we've got some native sunflower species to Colorado, including things like our common sunflower. Um, now, obviously, sunflower is not exactly a species that is going to stay where you put it. Sunflowers are annuals. And so they often will, the one plant blooms and then it dies off and then whatever seed spreads will potentially sprout next year in a new place. Um, so that is one thing to consider, you know, if you um, aren't happy with it moving, but a lot of sunflower species are native to Colorado. And if you plant them and then just leave the seed heads over winter, we're giving you permission to have a messy garden, just leave it out. Then a lot of the birds will fly in and eat those seeds all winter long. And that's a really wonderful way to offer them that natural food choice. They're also great for our native bees. So I just wanted to throw this in there because, um, you know, yes, they're great for birds, but then in the spring, summer, and fall when things are blooming, um, there's a teeny tiny little sweat bee that is inside of the sunflower picture. I took this right by our nature center and you can see a ton of the awesome yellow pollen that's over there on the leaf. So this teeny tiny little sweat bee and a lot of our native pollinators will also come in and use these flowers seasonally um, when they're blooming. So just a great kind of all around plant if you're looking to kind of diversify. And then I wanted to address ethical bird feeding. 
one of the questions that I have received often is, hey, is it really good to feed birds? Is that really something that you should be doing? And again, I think it depends on your intention. So anytime you feed any animal, you always want to be ethical about it. You always want to consider the pros and the cons. And of course, here in Colorado, and especially in Douglas County, and a lot of our communities, we are hot spots for bears consuming bird seed. Um, and I work very closely with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. This is something that we actually talk a lot about between our organizations. Um, and that's actually why they are starting to recommend, and I, I agree with them in a lot of ways, given the neighborhood that you're in, that you should feed birds seed from about November till about April 1st. Because as bears start to wake up, they are starving and they're looking for any type of caloric intake that they can find. I also have the experience of working with bears personally as a zookeeper uh, many, many years ago. And so I know how amazing their adaptations are um, and also what voracious appetites they have. And they're just so intelligent and they they can smell up to five miles away. They remember where certain places are to be able to get food. And so um, we want to kind of ask ourselves, is feeding the birds worth endangering another animal? And those are questions that you have to answer for yourself, given the neighborhood you live in. In downtown Denver, having a bear go after a bird feeder in the middle of the summer may not be a consideration, but in other communities right here around the metro area, it is. So those are just things that we have to keep in mind. And then the other thing too is it happens a lot, I see here in Parker actually, where people will have mule deer that'll come in in the winter as well and eat all the bird seed out of their feeder. And that can actually be fatal to mule deer, um, which, which some people just don't know, they don't realize, but there's a condition where if they consume that much bird seed, they actually can't pass it. Um, and then that causes them to, to get really, really sick and they die from that condition. Um, so there's just a lot of things to consider. If you're going to hang out a bird feeder in the winter, you want to make sure it's high enough so that a mule deer can't get to it, especially if you have a ton of mule deer in your neighborhood. These are just all things that we kind of have to consider if we're going to artificially feed birds. We do have bird feeders at the Audubon Nature Center. We do have them out seasonally, just in the dead of winter. Um, the other thing is, is, you know, we often will put them out for a program and then we might take them in. We're not filling them all the time. Oftentimes they're empty. So there's just things like that to keep in mind if you're going to artificially kind of feed birds. So I certainly wanted to take a few minutes and address that um, and some of those kind of thoughts and questions around bird feeders specifically. So a lot of our winter birds dine on berries, which is the other kind of side of the story that doesn't get talked about a lot. You know, people really want to help birds and their first thought is, well, let me put out a bird feeder in the winter. But a lot of our species need native shrubs like junipers. Well, juniper is a tree, but, you know, junipers, choke cherries, snow berries, three-leaf sumac. Um, and so something like a white crowned sparrow, for example, uh, there are going to be birds that are down here in the metropolitan area that are going after seeds and going after berries in the winter time. And so having some of these native shrub species incorporated into your landscape is a wonderful resource for them to be able to utilize as well. And then a lot of birds search for open and and flowing water. So places like ponds and lakes and rivers. If you're really looking to go find some birds and find some bird diversity in the winter, the key is to look for open water along the front range. And a lot of our neighborhoods, unless you have an artificial pond or part of a creek that goes through your neighborhood, a lot of our neighborhoods just don't have a ton of water resources. And so our neighborhoods at times, um, given where you live, can feel like a little inactive. There's not a lot of birds there, but that's because um, they really are trying to find that open water. That's where they prefer to be most of the time. So if you do have a bird bath, having a heated water source or really being adamant about providing a daily refill for, um, you know, a bird bath 
nets or a bowl that you would have out for birds is going to be really key. Um, and so this is a wonderful photo um, by a gentleman who had this heated bird bath. And he had this whole flock of robins that came in, plus a few European starlings, because a lot of robins will not go after backyard bird feeders. They're not going to eat those seeds because they don't consume seeds. They are berry eaters in the winter, but they were certainly happy to come in and check out his water source and then move on. And then considering things like space is really important. So window strikes uh, can be a huge issue even in the winter. And if you have a bird feeder that's too close to a window, that's something to kind of consider as well. So placing bird feeders close to shelter options, like close to a tree or placing perches in your yard at different heights, um, and then using different types of hardscaping like rocks or dead trees to create vertical layers and perches in your yard is also going to draw more birds to stay in the area. You can also take some bird seed and you can throw it on logs and under your bushes because a lot of our birds are ground feeders. So they prefer to be on the ground. That's where they feel safe to be able to grab some of those seeds. So hanging some bird feeders higher and then putting some um, lower is a great strategy. I love this picture that our volunteer Dick Vogel took. Um, this is a black cap chickadee on the left who literally looks like it's screaming at the face of this bush tit and the bush tit kind of looks like it's trying to to sort of get away from the sound um but it is a real thing if you don't have enough space around your bird feeders that you could get some angry birds sometimes they they will compete with each other and it can cause conflict if you put out just one bird feeder because then not everyone's allowed to space out and everyone's kind of competing so it's good to place your bird feeders in different spaces and then again just those final tips so things like suet have high fat and high protein plus the seeds um, and then a reliable source of water is really key as well to supporting birds in the winter and then having some sort of cover or safe place provided for them especially if it's days like yesterday where there was a lot of snow and really bitter cold temperatures they need to have that shelter in order to kind of survive through those periodic weather um things, weather incidences that we have. Okay, so squirrels. <laughs> there is some debate, given who you ask, if eastern fox squirrels are actually native to Colorado, or if they've just expanded their range westward. Um, there's a few different opinions on that. So the eastern fox squirrel is a native species, but it's not necessarily as native to Colorado as one might think. So way back in the day, if you look at the range maps of the eastern fox squirrel, there was a tiny little section of their range that dipped into kind of like the northeastern part of Colorado. And then we had prairie in between for many, 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 many miles and no trees. Then you came across the foothills. And what we've done in Colorado over the last 150 years is we've put up a lot of trees that historically were not here. And these little eastern fox squirrels have kind of started just following where the trees are. So um, that could be responsible for why we've seen an increase, a localized in increase in eastern fox squirrels over the last few decades. Some people love them. Some people hate them. Um, but if you look at this range map that I included, um, this was one of the range maps that I found back from 2007, though. But you'll see like there's a corner of Colorado where they sort of maybe historically were considered to be a permanent resident, but then I have found other maps that suggest that maybe actually they weren't here. So there's not a great consensus, but what we know now is that they're a part of our everyday life. Um, and so one of the things we might want to consider is if you put out artificial bird seed and the squirrels are just taking over bird feeders, there are some opportunities to help change that behavior. So putting things out like hot pepper suet or hot pepper flakes or cayenne pepper mixed in with your seed um, can actually deter squirrels because most songbirds and woodpeckers um, that are coming into your bird feeders do not have a sense of smell. So they're not deterred by the strong scent of those peppery items versus a squirrel that has an excellent sense of smell. And so they're going to smell that and decide, you know what, I, I think I'll go somewhere else and forage for my food. 
You can try to use baffles. A lot of people have no luck with baffles. The squirrels figure out how to go around them. I've also heard fun things about using Vaseline or Crisco to coat the poles because then you get to watch the squirrels try to climb up and slide down and climb up and slide down. Um, and if you are looking for something to do on the next snowy weather day that we have, you can also just go on the internet and like YouTube videos of like squirrel prevention. People have made obstacle courses. I mean, there's just been all kinds of fun things that people have tried uh, to deter squirrels from getting to their bird feeders. If you can't beat them, you can also just join them. So these are really fun little tables and uh, tree houses that people have made for their squirrels uh, just to kind of try to coexist and say, you know what, I'm not going to beat the squirrels, so I might as well also provide them um, with some food. So something like putting in, you know, gamble oak or scrub oak that's got native acorns that the squirrels can enjoy um, might encourage them to go to a different part of your property and enjoy those food resources um, as opposed to going after your bird feeders. So if you have other creative ideas, I would love to hear them um, if you've had things that have worked for you. So we're going to review some common winter birds um, for the for the last few minutes here. So if you are ready with your bird identification tools, uh, let's see how much you feel like you know. So on the left, we've got cedar waxwing. On the right, we've got a downy woodpecker. So cedar waxwings, these are beautiful birds that are here year round in the winter time and the summer. They actually love berries in the winter time as well. So one of the best places to find them are along rivers and creeks where there's a lot of berry producing shrubs. We don't tend to see a lot of them in our neighborhoods, just given whatever type of vegetation was planted there. Um, but we reliably see them at the Audubon Nature Center in the wintertime. And then a downy woodpecker. So we have another species of woodpecker as well in Colorado called the hairy woodpecker that has a beak about twice as long as this. So a downy woodpecker is going to be one of the most common woodpeckers that's going to come into your backyard bird feeder um, or just hang out in your backyard in general. I don't have a bird feeder, but I heard one calling in our neighborhood just the other day. They have this short kind of tiny little petite beak. Um, so that's a little bit different from the hairy woodpecker pecker that has that much longer beak. So I'm going to start with the sparrows because sparrows really frustrate people. So we'll just get those out of the way. Um, these are all different species of sparrow. They're also called little brown jobs or LBBs, the little brown birds. And um, these are all sparrows that we would see here in the winter. We also have migratory sparrows. So it will get more complicated in the next couple of months. But to start, the one on the left actually has the color white in its name. So this is a white crowned sparrow. And then the one on the right is a bird called an American tree sparrow. And what's nice about them is they are typically just winter migrants to Colorado. We do have another species of sparrow that looks very similar, but they're migratory. They won't show up here until like April. So there could be some overlap given, you know, the American tree sparrow and the chipping sparrow that's the migrant, but um, there's a couple of subtle differences. So this bird on the right has a dark bill on top and a bottom kind of orange lighter bill. And that's one of the field marks that can tell you that it's an American tree sparrow. And then the one on the bottom, this is our invasive species of sparrow. So this is uh, sometimes called the uh, house sparrow, but it's also the English sparrow. So these are the sparrows that you see hanging out in really urbanized areas. They're the ones that fly into King Supers or fly into Denver International Airport and hang out up in the rafters. Um, they are not at all afraid of people and they are able to forage on a lot of different things that we have around human man-made structures. And so the house sparrow is an invasive species. Um, this is not one of our native sparrow species that was historically in the state of Colorado. Okay, everyone take a breath. The sparrows are done. I'm not gonna torture you with sparrows tonight. But these are two of our, our two chickadee species. 
Uh, a lot of people actually aren't aware that we have two chickadee species in Colorado, so we certainly do. And in Douglas County, we get a fair amount of both of them. So on the left, we've got our black capped chickadee, and then on the right, we have our mountain chickadee. So they have what we call a white supercilium. Them. They have kind of that white eyebrow um, above their eye, and so that black is broken up. And black capped chickadees are more commonly at lower elevations. Mountain chickadees tend to prefer um, the upper foothills to montane all the way into subalpine forest. But on occasion in the wintertime, you might have an influx of mountain chickadees too. So it's good to do a double take because you just don't know. You never know. So it's good to double check and make sure um, what species of chickadee you might have. I also included a slide on our three nuthatch species. So we have uh, the red breasted, the white breasted, and then the one here on the right is our pygmy nuthatch. So the red breasted and the white breasted are more common um, amongst backyard bird feeders, hence the photos. Pygmy nut hatches don't tend to come into backyard bird feeding situations as much um, because they prefer a little bit different habitat. They really like to have established evergreen trees and lots of them. Um, and then sometimes they're confused actually with the chickadees, both the mountain chickadee and the black capped chickadee. People confuse them sometimes when they're first starting out birding. Um, but we have three different nut hatch species in the state and that's it. There's no other ones to worry about. This is another really wonderful bird um, that most people in Colorado don't ever notice, which is why I like to point it out during this presentation, because wintertime is one of the best times to see them. This is a bird that's about two and a half inches to three inches long. It's teeny tiny, and it's called a brown creeper. And in the wintertime on these large cottonwood trees that have this really kind of you know rough bark, the brown creepers will fly in and they do this really cool spiraling behavior where they kind of hop up in a spiral up to the top of the cottonwood tree. And in the wintertime, it's just so easy because all the leaves are gone. But in the summertime, I have a really difficult time spotting brown creepers. The most of the time when I've seen a reliable sighting of a brown creeper, it's in the, the dead of winter. Um, and because they're brown and they just they blend in, but they're a really cool little tiny bird with these super long toes and they allows them to be able to kind of do this really interesting behavior up, up a cottonwood tree. And then here's those two different woodpecker species again for comparison. So here's our downy woodpecker on the left. So the picture you saw before was actually a female because she did not have a red dot and the male does have a red dot so you can see here the differences between male and female and then we've got the hairy woodpecker so you can see the size of this bird the hairy woodpecker is larger than the downy and it also has a beak that's almost the same size as its skull so a very very long long beak and then this is one of my favorite woodpeckers. Some people have a love-hate relationship with this species because they have a tendency to peck on people's houses uh, come springtime. But this is our northern flicker. And we have two different color variations of northern flicker in Colorado. We've got this, the orange shafted and the yellow shafted or the red shafted and the yellow shafted. Um, and they're the same exact species because they inter, they breed with each other and then they create what's called an integrade. So the males are the ones that have the dark mustache and then the female is the one on the bottom right. So she does not have any coloration like that. Um, and so she's just a little bit more gray in color, but they are just amazing, amazing birds. And all of the woodpeckers are really critical ecosystem engineers to excavate nesting cavities for a lot of our migratory birds. So if we were to get rid of all the woodpeckers, a lot of our other bird species would collapse. Um, so as much as we may not love them, I try to encourage people to have respect for them and admiration for them because they do a lot of really good things for us. Here's a bunch of birds with orange on them. People get these really confused too. So on the um, left, we've got our spotted tohi. On the right, we have a bird that most people are familiar with, which is our American robin. 
We also have a migratory species called the black-headed grosbeak. So they don't show up until spring and summer. Um, so if you learn the spotted towhee and you learn the American robin, then if you see a black-headed grosbeak come migration season, you might go, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense because of the time of year. Um, so it's not common that you would see a black-headed grosbeak in and around the Denver metro area in the winter time. And then we've got a lot of small blackbirds. So these are all here currently still, but red-winged blackbirds in particular change the way that they move about the landscape as well as American robins. American robins are here in the winter too, throughout the entire winter season. So red-winged blackbirds, American robins, they flock together in these huge flocks and they move about looking for food from place to place. Most of the time, our neighborhoods don't provide enough food resources for them. So the places to go find these large flocks are places like our open spaces um, and our state parks where there's been land set aside for these large flocks that have enough food resources for them. This is a female red-winged blackbird, one of the most misidentified birds in Colorado because people say, oh, it looks like a sparrow on steroids. Yes, it does. It's about twice the size of any of our sparrows, but it's a female red-winged blackbird. So this is a really good bird to learn um, to be able to kind of help start to distinguish some of those birds coming into your feeders. And then European starlings, those are an invasive species again. Um, they were introduced to North America, actually New York City, they were introduced. And uh, from New York City, they spread westward and now they are everywhere. And then our large blackbirds, one is a crow, one is a raven. And there are ways to tell the difference between the two species in Colorado. And in Douglas County, especially, we have a lot of both species. I always have to double check. So the common raven's the one on the left and the American crow is the one on the right. So you'll notice that the common raven has a really hooked beak. That's because they tend to be um, even more adapted for actually attacking other animals. Um, they'll also scavenge a lot as well. And they'll kind of just eat anything and everything they can find. A lot of our corvids are like that. The corvid family are the ravens, the crows, the magpies, and the jays. And we'll meet the jays in a minute. The American crow has a smaller beak. They're also by size comparison a little bit smaller. And the common raven, I think too, I like to describe it. It looks like he's got a little bit of a five o'clock shadow. He's got some, some kind of ruffled feathers underneath his chin. Um, so these are kind of things you can look for if a bird perches or comes into your backyard. There's also some call differentiations as well. So American crows, most people know they sound very clear. Caw, caw, caw. And a common raven is going to sound more like it's got a loogie caught in its throat. It's kind of this much more deep sort of guttural call. So here's all of our J. They're birds that are blue, but they are not bluebirds. So bluebirds typically don't show up until spring migration, although we've had a couple sightings already in February, which is not uncommon. Usually, sometimes even as early as January, we'll see a few here and there. Um, but the majority of them will start migrating here in the next few weeks. So these are all of our different J species. Um, if you know what some of them are, if you're from the East Coast, maybe, and you grew up there, you might be familiar with the Blue Jay. Blue Jay was not historically in Colorado. Um, they are another bird that moved westward with uh, the expansion of suburban neighborhoods and the addition of trees. This is our Stellar's Jay. Um, so this is a montane forest to subalpine forest jay. We've got our pinion jays, which tend to be further south in Colorado and specialize in the pinion pine forest. But on occasion, we get a few flocks of pinion jays up in, up in the metro area. So it's, again, always good to just double check um, and see if you can tell the difference if you've got some birds coming into your feeders. And then we also have the woodhouse's scrub jay down here on the Right. Uh, years ago, it was called the Western Scrub Jay. They actually changed the name. So now it's the Woodhouse Scrub Jay because the California Scrub Jay and the Woodhouse Scrub Jay were separated into two different species. And historically, they were all thought to be the Western Jay. So here's our doves and our pigeons. We've got our rock pigeon, our morning dove, and our invasive Eurasian collared dove. 
So our morning dove is our native dove species. Both rock pigeons and Eurasian collar doves are invasive introduced species. These are the birds that actually consume seeds 99% of the time. And then they'll throw in a snail every once in a while for some calcium. So these are our true seed eaters. All the other birds that we've met are seed eaters in the winter and then they, or berry eaters, and then they switch their diet to mostly insects in spring, summer, and early fall during nesting season. These are a group of birds called the juncos, and they're actually also sparrows. So they should kind of be close next to the sparrows, but a lot of people don't associate them with being sparrows. So they have their own slide. We have four different types, but they're all, again, the same species. They're just subspecies. So we've got Oregon, slate, pink-sided, and gray-headed, but all of these are actually genetically the same species of bird, which is really crazy. They just have some different color morphs and express their colors differently. And then if you happen to see a dash of yellow fly into your bird feeder or into your backyard, there's a couple different options in the winter. One could be an American goldfinch incognito. So this is what they look like in their non-breeding plumage. A lot of people associate the return of spring with seeing brightly colored American goldfinch males but they actually don't leave the state. They just lose that breeding plumage. And then another similar species is the pine siskin. So pine siskins, as you can see, have more of kind of the stripy appearance, and that dash of yellow is actually on their wing um, versus an American goldfinch that's going to have more yellow throughout the face and the beak. And then we've got a couple small raptors to consider too. So we've got our prairie falcon here on the left and our American kestrel on the right. Being small raptors, small birds of prey, their food is available year round. So they're able to hunt mice very easily um, in Colorado and voles. So it's not an issue for them. So that's why they're able to stay here year round and be able to hunt all the time. And then if you do put up a bird feeder, you should be aware of sometimes the uh, possibility of there being feeder frenzy. So this is the Cooper's hawk. Cooper's hawk and sharp shin hawk are very difficult to tell the difference um, if you're a beginning birder. I still struggle with them sometimes, given the situation, the circumstance. There are times where I'm like, oh, absolutely, I know that's a sharp shin. Absolutely, I know it's a Cooper's. And then other times I feel like I don't have enough information in the situation to be able to choose it either way. Um, but Cooper's hawks have been known for going after small birds. So we have gotten panicked phone calls from people who feed birds. There's a Cooper's hawk in my neighborhood. What do I do? And the answer is you can take in your bird feeder. It's okay. If you leave your bird feeder out and there's a bunch of little birds feeding at it, they are sitting targets for that Cooper's hawk. So take the feeder in. The birds will be fine. They will scatter. They'll go feed other places and forage, and then they'll come back. They're not going to rely on that bird seed that you put out for them. And then I wanted to just couple, uh, cover two fun birds that we've had recently that are eruptive migrants. So you might have heard, uh, there's been a few different articles, the news has covered it, I think, too, of these amazing birds that are down here right now from way up north. These are bohemian waxwings. So cedar waxwings are here in Colorado year round, but bohemian waxwings are an eruptive migrant and they're only here certain seasons and certain years. And it's cyclical based on what's happening up in like the Arctic and Canada. So our board president, Kurt Frankenfeld, who's also a master birder and a volunteer for Douglas Land Conservancy, spotted bohemian waxwings for the first time on the January 1st Christmas bird count in Cherry Hills Village. So that was really exciting and he got a couple of photos. So this is normally where their range would be. They tend to be a little bit further up north, um, again in Canada and parts of Alaska, but certain years we'll get these like bang up kind of migratory groups of cedar waxwing or bohemian waxwings that'll come into Colorado. And it's been one of those years. It's been really fun and exciting. Um, so that's a great thing to look out for if you're out and about exploring Douglas County lands or parks. Um, there's still a lot of them being sighted right now. 
And then this is one other little guy who is an eruptive seasonal migratory bird. This is a northern shrike. Um, we do have other species. We have a loggerhead shrike in Colorado as well. Um, but this is a northern shrike and uh, the loggerhead shrike, their regular range tends to be actually further south. So in the winter time, we get these northern shrikes that'll show up um, and they'll come hang out with us in Colorado for a little while. They'll hunt and then they'll leave uh, at the start of spring migration and they actually go northward into places like Alaska. So these are really fun robin size. So they're not very big and they're known for killing their prey and like piercing it on barbed wire fences. So if you see a small bird or a small mammal, especially if some of you have like property with barbed wire fences and something gets strung on it, you probably have a northern shrike in your neighborhood. And then I also wanted to just mention Project Feeder Watts, Project Feeder Watch. So if you're interested in con contributing to some community science and helping scientists to understand what some of these birds are doing in the winter, you can sign up at any time. It's through the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. You can watch birds at your backyard bird feeder or close to your home, and then you submit those observations and let them know who you're seeing. They also have a lot of really wonderful tools, like games that you can play to help you with identifying backyard birds. Um, and they've got a lot of great information on if you're going to feed birds, what type of food to use, what sorts of seeds attract what birds. It's a huge database and a really wonderful tool. So with that, I am going to end. Um, it's eight o'clock. So if anybody has any questions, Amy, um, I'm happy to answer those right now. I saw a couple of them coming in the chat, but I have not looked at them yet. Okay, one, uh, the other questions were just um, issues with uh, watching the video, but this one is, uh, do black oil sunflower seeds have shells? Yes. Yep, so a lot of times you can buy black oil sunflower with the, there's, they have the shells intact. And a lot of birds actually prefer that um, because that encourages the natural foraging behavior that they're accustomed to. So they have these really sharp beaks designed to be able to pierce into those seeds. The other thing that's really cool with black oil sunflower is a lot of birds will hide them in the winter time. So by keeping the shell on it, they'll fly in grab one black oil sunflower still with the shell and they'll fly off somewhere nearby and they'll hide it for later. And that also helps them when like there's a winter storm or it's super cold and they're having a difficult time finding food sources other places. So it's beneficial to keep the shell on and to get the um, black oil sunflower that still has the shell on. You can also get just hold sunflower seeds if you'd prefer not the mess of sunflower shells. That's the only questions right now in the Q&A oh, okay. or the chat. So it, uh, we'll just take one more minute or two if anybody wants to add anything. I'm really glad that you mentioned uh, the presence of the Bohemian Waxwings in our region right now. If anyone um, that's on the call tonight on the webinar hasn't ever um, seen Douglas Land Conservancy's Facebook page, we have a wonderful feature, Wildlife Wednesday, where people can uh, submit backyard photos, uh, photos that they took while hiking, whatever, but any um, any photo of wildlife in uh, Douglas or Albert counties. And so it's been really fun. It's a fun feature and we get lots of cool photos, silly photos of, bird, of bears and bird baths and, and things like that. But it, there's also a citizen science element to it. And we've w witnessed uh, every week for probably yeah, like you said, like almost two full months with these Bohemia wax wings and everyone is out looking for them. It's pretty neat. So that's been fun. And then we anticipate um, in the next couple of months, the return of, of um, hummingbirds and bears coming out of hibernation. And we can kind of track when that happens each year uh, on our on our Wildlife Wednesday feature. So Douglas Land Conservancy's page on Facebook has that. So it's kind of fun. And let me see. I think there's one other question. Yeah, Susan wants World. to know. Okay, go ahead. You got it. Really yeah. work. Um, so the short answer to the question is it depends. And then the long answer to the question is 
Well, it depends on how smart your squirrels are. So, Mm -hmm. um, I mean, truthfully, as somebody who uh, has worked with a lot of different animals over the course of my career, sometimes um, certain populations of squirrel will figure out how to get through a cage and then they'll teach their offspring how to get through the cage. Um, So you kind of have to like respect the personalities and the intelligence level of the squirrels that are in your backyard, which I think (laughs) is why some people have gotten really creative with like obstacle courses and (laughs) trying like all these different slinkies on bird feeders. Um, there's just all kinds of things that people have tried and some squirrels figure out how to get through almost all of it. So Mm -hmm. it's just, yeah, it's kind of something where you have to do trial and error. And then ultimately, if it's just not worth it, if you just keep feeding more squirrels than you do birds, then maybe the option is to put some more native plants into your landscape and take away your artificial bird feeders. So I don't Mm -hmm. feed birds at my home in Parker because I have a squirrel who (laughs) trolls the film and my backyard is tiny. So if I were to put a feeder in, he would literally be able just to like jump and get to the feeder. I just don't have enough space. So I decided to put in plants instead. And one year I had some corn that was out in my front yard and that was like for Thanksgiving, like a cornucopia type situation. And the squirrel came and gnawed on the corn and destroyed it this year. So <laughs> somehow we still found something. That's funny. Well, thank you, Kate. Uh, we love our, our partnership with Denver Audubon. And thank you, everybody who joined in this evening. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you on the 28th for another presentation with Kate. Thank you. Have a wonderful night. Close. Take care.